to our uh, kids singing in that. Maybe next week we'll try to get a song sent out this afternoon. And, and uh, so if I don't have your phone number, let me know if you have children and we'll try to get that sent to you because we want them to sing. This morning, it's just great to be in the house of God. And, and uh, I, I want to I talk to you about something that, that God just spoke into my spirit this week. And, and I felt like I just needed to talk to you about. Uh, you know, the Bible said, Jesus says this in John chapter 15 and verse 13, Greater love hath no man than this, than that a man would lay down his life for his friend. I want to talk to you briefly about the love of God. The love of God. You know, I don't totally understand the love of God. You don't totally understand the love of God because when you stop to think about how God's love works, it's too big for us in our little brains to be able to understand how God totally thinks. We can't quite figure all that out. But that's what makes him God is because he thinks beyond us. He thinks above us, beyond us. He thinks uh, uh, in a deeper rim than what we think in. But to think about greater love, there's no bigger love than the love of a man that would be willing to lay down his life for his friends. There's a lot of people that might would lay down their life for their son, lay down their life for their daughter, lay down their life for their grandchildren, but there aren't many people that would be willing to take a chance to lose their own life for somebody that they are just an acquaintance with or that they don't really know very well. But this explains what the love of God is all about. The love of God is a great thing. When I was thinking of this story, uh, I mean this text about the love of God, I thought about Mike White. Now, most of us know Mike White. Mike White grew up around here. I think he and Galifas may have gone to school about the same age and, and uh, with Ted and, and some of the rest of you. Mike, you know, about a few years back, three, four years ago, uh, went into total kidney failure. And, you know, with kidney failure, it's a matter of uh, you're on a time zone and you live so many years. And, and unless something happens, uh, somebody comes across that is a good donor for you, you're in trouble. That, that's a bad disease. Well, there was a guy that Mike briefly knew, not, not knew well. They weren't best bosom buddies. They weren't best of friends. But they were friends enough that they knew one another, called one another by names, and would go to car shows together. And he went and was tested to see if he might be a likely candidate to give his kidney to Mike. And he went, and he was almost a perfect match for that. And he went to the hospital and had him to remove, had them to remove one of his kidneys to give to somebody that he just not much more than knew. Now, I don't know what you would analyze that to be, but I would analyze to be that, that to be a tremendous gift of love. Not many of us understanding that you only have two, and if you lose one of them, you can function with one as long as you don't have any trouble but would be willing to go through the surgical process and to give away a kidney to somebody that you only casually and briefly knew, that is a tremendous gift and a tremendous sacrifice. Would you agree to that? Amen. That would be tremendous for somebody to do that. Well, when I stop to think about Jesus, who went far beyond a surgical procedure, far beyond the gift of a kidney, I'm thinking about one that paid the ultimate price that he did not owe to give it to you and me and to pay the price that we were so totally indebted to. The Bible said, we all know John 3, 16, God so loved the world. Now, when I talk about friendship between the nature of God and what the world consists of, if I were to tell you that they were one of the same, it would be an oxymoron because there could not be anything more distant or more different than God and the world. The world is sin, God is righteous. The world has so much evil and God has nothing but good. But in the middle of all of that, God did not look at the nature and see the evilness of the world. 
What God saw was is the potential of the world if he would come and die for it. He came as a sacrificial sacrifice, a lamb, an offering for the sins of the entire world. When he went to Calvary, righteousness died for unrighteousness. Godliness died for ungodliness. That which is good died for that which was evil. The sinful, sinfulness of man was paid for by the sinlessness of God. God loved us in that kind of love. God so loved the world. There is no way that you can love something and care about it and have the potential of benefiting it or improving it and not be willing to give to that improvement. So when he saw the condition of the world, he was willing to give himself for the improvement of the world, and the Bible said he loved it so much that he gave his only begotten son. That all we had to do was to believe, and if we would believe, we would not perish, but we would have everlasting life. Now what that verse is telling me is, is that when I was hopelessly lost without God and hopelessly lost in sin, Jesus took my place at Calvary and died for me that I did not have to die. What it also tells me is, is that God loved me when I did not have a nature to even love myself. God cared more for me than any person had ever cared for me in my entire life. But he said there's a condition based on this eternal life that I'm willing to give you and the sacrifice that I'm offering for you at Calvary. And that is you've got to believe in what the Son of God has done for you. If you're not a believer in the sacrifice of Calvary, and to be a believer means that you accept it and you're willing to follow it and willing to do the things that God called upon you to do. I reject him, I push him aside, I say no to Jesus, I decide to live my own lifestyle, go by my own ways, do my own things instead of following after God. I cannot expect eternal life, but I can expect what that verse said when it said if you don't do that, you're going to perish because if you do do that, you will not perish. In you this morning is the potential to make a decision. My choice is, will I serve God or will I not serve God? The love of God has proven himself to me. Now, the love of me will prove myself to God if I am willing to give a sacrifice unto him. Am I willing to give a sacrifice unto God? Am I willing to give myself as he gave himself for me to devote my life, my daily activities, to give up my all for the cause of Jesus? See, he was willing because he loved us. That's what the love of God is about. The love of God didn't see us as we were. He saw us as we could be. He did not see us in the condition that we were in. He saw us in the condition we could be in if he would come to Calvary for us. God loves you more than you've ever been loved in your life. He cares more for you and more about you than any person has ever cared for you. The Bible said in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, Hereby perceive we the love of God. Hereby means we recognize or we identify with the love of God. <coughs> How do we recognize the love of God? I identify with the love of God, it said there in 1 John 3, 16, because he laid down his life for us. When I understand the sacrifice of what Jesus did, how he took my place, the nobility of his act, the greatness of his righteousness and the things that he did for me. It's not hard for me to recognize and identify Jesus must truly love me. He must not just love me in word. He has loved me in the ultimate action. He has taken my place and gone to the pits of hell for me in order that I would not have to go there. You today are here and all you have to do is say yes to the love of God. He's all around you. He is here compassionately desiring for you to say yes. When he sat in the heavens, when he sat in his place of protection and looked down upon man and saw the cries of men's soul that could never come in contact with God, he made a decision. 
His decision was, I will die for them and take their place in death that they can live and live forevermore. He made that choice. He made that decision. But what kind of a decision are we making today? Are we making a decision to say yes to Jesus? Are we making a decision to say yes to God and to follow after the ways of God? See, nobody can make that choice for you. It's your choice to make. <coughs> nobody can say yes to God for you. He said, choose you this day whom you will serve. You've got to make that decision, and it comes because of love. When I look at the love of God and the death of Calvary, Calvary was not an easy death. It was not like he walked up to somebody in good health and they pierced him through with a sword and that was the end. They humiliated him. They humiliated him before all the public. They mocked him as a king. They said, you claim to be the king of the Jews. If you're the king of the Jews, why don't you call the angels to come and to take you down from this cross? And he could have done that. But he chose not to do that. They embarrassed him. They humiliated him. They did every act of remorseful shame that they could put upon him. But he never once backed away from the call and the reason that he came. He never looked at his own condition. All he looked at was our condition. All he saw was men and women in sin, boys and girls needing a Savior. All he saw was a world that if he did not offer them the help that they needed, they were going to perish in hell without him. God loved them and cared for them. <coughs> the Bible said in Romans 5, 8, God commendeth his love toward us. It means he entrusted his love toward us. He committed it. <coughs> he gave his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He commended his love toward us. He entrusted his love to you, and he entrusted his love to me, that while I was yet a sinner, he didn't die for the righteous, he died for the unrighteous. The Bible said, Verily for a righteous man would any man die. He died because he saw a world that was desperately in need of a Savior. He died because he saw a world that was desperately in need of a touch of God and when he saw that he died for us Christ died for the sinner of whom I was a chief Paul wrote that of himself and you could write that as your own testimony I was a chief among sinners if I had been the only person in the entire world that had ever committed a wrong Jesus would have died if there was only one person in the entire world that, only, that was scarred and mired by sin Jesus would have been willing to die for them. He commendeth his love toward us. He gave his love. He had the love, but he had it all through the Old Testament. But when he came, he gave that love. <coughs> there was nothing better that he could give. The love of God is a powerful source. So powerful, so strong, it envelops you. I know and remember well when Jesus walked into my life. It will soon be 50 years ago. God walked into my life and God cared for me and loved me from that day to now. He never chose to love me on the basis if I was good, he would love me. He never said to me, you're my son and I'll love you if you're a good boy and I won't care for you if you're a bad one. He said, I'm going to love you unconditionally. The choice is yours how you live your life and eternity will judge how you live your life, but you're not going to take me away from the love of God. I like the way Paul wrote it in the 8th chapter of Romans, beginning at verse 35. He said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us? In other words, who is here that can detach me from the love of God. Once I've come into the attachment of the love of God and I've been isolated to the Lord, you can't move me away from that position. I am here. Praise God. Are you glad for that this morning? Give God praise in the house. Hallelujah. 
Who shall separate me? Who shall detach me from the love of God? And then he goes through a large banner of things. He said, can tribulation separate you from the love of God? Tribulation means misfortune. It means that you're under trial, you're under suffering. But suffering doesn't separate you from the love of God, and trial doesn't separate you from the love of God. Sometimes we judge a person's trial as though that God doesn't love them anymore. When Job walked through his trial, and he's going through all the things that he's going through, his three comforters that came, all constantly, an entire book, they're saying to him, Job, confess up. You've done something wrong. you failed God. You've made a mistake or you wouldn't be going through this. But in all of that, Job never one time backed up in his tribulation and said, I'm giving up on God. But here's what he left the testimony to say. His body is, is covered with boils and, 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 and he is so sore he can hardly move and he's hurting all over. And he leaves this testimony. I know that my Redeemer liveth and that in the last days he shall stand upon the earth and though the skin worms have destroyed this body yet in my flesh shall I see God. Can persecution separate me from God? No. Persecution doesn't mean that I'm out of contact with God. It may mean that God's sending some fire into my life to, to, to purge me or to clean me or maybe perhaps God is just reforming me into a new design. What God is doing is sometimes just making an effort to get our hearts in a condition that he can reach us. What shall separate me from the love of Christ shall distress, which means grief or misery, Shall grief? No. Even the more I'll draw closer to the love of God at the times of my grief. He said, what about persecution? What about if somebody is harassing you or making an effort to intimidate you or they're trying to torture you or to make life miserable for you? Will you throw up your hands and say, no, God? or that I cannot serve God. No, in those moments uh, I will find out that the love of God cannot be detached from me just because men fail me. God will be faithful. Hallelujah. Give him praise in the house. He said, can famine separate me from God? Can nakedness separate me from God? Can peril or a sword? No. Perils will come, dangerous times will come, threats will come, but they will not separate me from God. For in verse 37 he said, no, in all these things, he answers that about all those questions, and he said, no, but in all these things, I am more than a conqueror, more than a victor, more than a defender through him that loved me. Hallelujah! Isn't God good in the house today. Then he says in verse 38, I am persuaded. I am confident. I am absolutely positive. I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor principalities, that's demonic forces, nor powers of things present nor things to come shall separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. God's love is permanent, and it's with you forever. If you believe it, give God praise. The Bible said the love of God constraineth us. It means that sometimes God limits us and God puts restrictions on us. And if we don't walk outside of the boundaries, the Bible said the steps of a good man are ordered by God. I have found out in life that most of my troubles come when I walk on my own instead of being led by the Spirit of God. When God takes me somewhere, everything works. When I go on my own, I'm on my own. It may work and may not. 
but the love of God constraineth us. God reaches out to us in compassion and in kindness. The Bible says to us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, it said, God, love is of God. You know why? Because in verse 8 he said, for God is love. The very nature of love is the nature of God. I don't ever have to worry about getting up in the morning and because things are going sour all around me that I cannot find that protector or find that defense or find that peace. No. All I've got to do is say yes to God and say to God, I know you are with me. Though I don't feel you, though I don't see you, though I cannot touch you, I still know that by faith I can reach my hand into the uh, plentifulness of God and there will never be a shortage of whatever I need. I am pleading to the blood of Calvary. I am pleading to the sacrifice of Calvary. I am pleading my cause into the love of God that God will not fail me. Hallelujah. The Bible said in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. God who is rich in mercy. God loved us with a great love. Not just a love, but a great love. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 17. The Bible said to know the love of Christ. To know the love of Christ. I grew up around a family. All of my grandparents were saved. They were good folks. My grandfather on my low side was not saved when I was a real young boy, but when I was about 10 years old or so, he came to Jesus, gave his life to God. My grandfather on my mother's side and my grandparents had served God and preached from back into the 19-teens this way until their death. They were wonderful people, and I saw God in their life. My mother and father never served God until later on in life. But when I was growing up, my mother and father didn't go around church. They didn't go to church. They, they didn't go to the house of God. And so what limited knowledge I had of God came from the tremendous amount of time that I stayed around my grandparents. I never questioned the fact they had it. I never questioned that at all. My grandmother on the low side, you could have told her today, you know, I just got angry at somebody and shot them. And tomorrow, if they were to say, did you hear that he got arrested for shooting someone? She wouldn't even agree and say, yeah, he told me he did that. You didn't get anything out of her. I mean, when you told her in the ear, it zipped in the mouth. And nothing ever came out. She was a wonderful, wonderful Christian lady. I was blessed to have wonderful, wonderful grandparents. And I, I'm telling you, I appreciated that. I look back, I love my grandparents just like I did my parents. But my parents taught me to do that. My grandmothers, we called them mom, just like we did our mother. Because we held that honor and respect for them. We believed in them, and we believed in the God that they believed in, although we didn't have it ourselves. Oh, but I want to tell you something. The love of God, which passeth knowledge, that we might be filled with all the fullness of God, there came that moment of time that the love of God came to me. And when he came, things changed. I have not always been able to be up in every case. I've had stumbles and falls and misfortunes and, and, and I've had troubles along life and I've had a few folks I've wanted to knock in the head. And I know that you can't relate to that. I understand. I understand you can't relate to that at all because you've had the perfect atmosphere. But I haven't. I didn't. But one day, 
Jesus came into my life. I still had blunders. I still had mistakes. I still had failures. But he never gave up on me. He just kept right on loving me. He kept right on loving me. Through it all. Songwriter said, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. There's no place you can go quite like Jesus. As we stand in the building this morning, if you are in this building and you are in need, remember, Jesus didn't have to die for you, but he had you on his mind when he went to Calvary. He had you in his mind and you were the one that he died for because he cared about you more than anyone else in the world. That's between you and him. As we sing, the altar is open and I'm asking you to come. To come to a place of prayer and people will gather with you and we'll pray for you.